Welcome back to DC's EKG with Eric Uland and myself, Joe Grogan. We're going to hear some more with Tom Phillipson, one of the nation's most insightful and well-respected economists. We're looking to talk to Tom in this segment more about the macro economy here in the United States, not just not just uh, drug pricing and healthcare as we were in the first segment. So, Tom, let's get into it right now. I mean, what are you seeing uh, when you are looking across the economy? Moderate, moderating inflation, supposedly at you know below five percent. We are at twelve months running deficit now of about one point nine trillion dollars in a time of peace. And we're facing this debt limit crisis, uh, which to me is an, it's kind of crazy to think that we can't come to a resolution on this. But what are you seeing right now? What's keeping you up at night, if anything? Well, I think the long run trend, which continues, I think which is by far the most important trend in my view, is that real uh, personal income and also real wages have been going down. That's ultimately what a household cares about, meaning how much can they buy with a paycheck they're getting every month, essentially. And all these statistics about this and that and is kind of irrelevant for households, but that is probably the most relevant thing. And we have seen that standard of living, meaning real income and and real wages been declining on a 12 month basis for two years now. So that's a pretty severe uh, trend for people, even though GDP has gone up and down, et cetera. Why, so I think the middle class, why, why, the middle how class, have the, the Biden administration yeah. messed that up so dramatically? Well, one thing is obviously inflation, which makes you, and the paycheck is not keeping up with inflation, which makes you buy, be able to buy less with your paycheck. That's probably the major thing driving it. But there's also obviously a <clears throat> regulatory onslaught that is actually worse than Obama, and which almost disappeared under Trump, actually. Uh, and that has been going on, particularly in energy, but also in, in other sectors. So there's all this stuff that kind of constrains supply. At the same time, we have had massive stimulus of demand, which has led to uh, increased prices together with a massive increase of the money supply, meaning the Fed was essentially monetizing much of this spending uh, uh, by buying the debt from the government. So I think that uh, that is the most important economic record or time series, whatever you want to want to call it, evidence of the Biden era so far that is really hurtful to families, and that's why Americans are upset, regardless of how many jobs are added, et cetera, which I think is misleading relative to that overall trend. So in a world right now where we see this significant decline in real wages, you do have these billboards about economic growth, claims that inflation is slowing, although I think everybody has forgot how sticky inflation really is and how much it insinuates into the economy. And looking at projections of what's going to happen here over the next 12, 15, 18 months. What's your thought about general economic trends when it comes to employment? Can we get out of this wage decline hole? Where will we be by the time next spring summer rolls around and people are really looking about what's going on in their paycheck, in their wallet, as they start thinking about who to vote for in the fall of 24? Yeah, in terms of forecasting, I think most smart economists stay away from that. There's a saying, you know, forecasting is really difficult, especially when it is about the future. So, uh, so basically, I think you know, if you if you think you can forecast the economy, first of all, you should be a trillionaire. Second of all, you don't understand what you're doing. <laughs> you don't understand what you don't understand, basically. So, I think that's a little bit of problem. I think if particular economists have missed. I've kept claiming that the recession is coming. This is the most advertised recession ever, I think. And it hasn't really hit home yet, essentially, in terms of it depends on how you define a recession. If you if it's a cost of living in a recession, like I talked about, it's been going on for two years, but that's typically not how we define a recession. So then it just becomes to, you know, about vocabulary. How do you de how do you describe a tough economic time for whole households? Does it matter that you call it a recession or not? I tend to think it doesn't matter at all. I also tend to think uh, 
Recessions should not be defined by acad academics uh, up in Cambridge, which is how it's currently uh, being uh, that defined. Two consecutive every... quarters of negative GDP growth. No, that's that's like a rule of thumb. But actually, yeah. the, the actual definition of recession comes from the National Bureau of Economic Research, which is an academic consortium of researchers. But it's also, you know, academia is not known for being <clears throat> the most market oriented in some sense. So it's like having MSNBC declare a recession. <laughs> so how yeah. how would you declare, Tom? How would right. you declare a recession? How do you what do you think a better measure of recession? No, what I think is most important is real income and real wages. Uh, that's I don't really, you know, for me, for most people, that's the most important aspect, is particularly for, for the middle class. So if I was president, that's what I would be staring at. Obviously, this president don't want to talk about that. They talk about nominal gains. Oh, wages are going up, even though inflation is going up more than wages, essentially. So it's a lot of distraction going on from that particular trend, which I think is the most important trend. Are you worried about uh, the interest rate increases and our ability to service the national debt? And maybe you talk a little bit, there's, there's a lot of chatter about the dollar as the world's reserve currency getting displaced by... Uh, you know, maybe the one and the one and the euro or something like that. Do you think that's a real threat or is that overblown? Well, I think the, the as a reserve currency, there's a long way to go for the one in the sense it's 3% rough. The U.S. is about 60% and the euro is about 20%. So that's a long way ahead. And those and are holdings, right? Or relative share right. of yeah, central currencies? Bank okay. reserve. Yeah, yeah, central bank reserve. So there's a long way to go there. And I think people don't trust China enough to make it the world currency, essentially. You don't want to hold a, have a world currency whether you're at the whims of the, of the Communist Party in China. So I think that's uh, currently, it may not be in the future, but currently, I think it's a little over over exaggerated. In terms of the debt, I think now, obviously, we run up in a situation where we we are now facing increased amount of debt. At the same time, we're increasing interest rates. So our cost of financing the debt has gone through the roof. So think of your car payments. The size of your car payments is both the size of the car you buy or this, how expensive car you buy or borrow for it, but also the interest rate at, at which you borrow. So both the loan size and the interest rate has been going up, which has made the cost of servicing that debt, uh, uh, you know, explode and is, is projected to be, go beyond defense in a couple of years, essentially. So I think that's very, very troublesome. I mean, essentially, we've created a, you know, the adults in the room have created a government so big that we need to lean on our kids to, to pay for it, essentially. And this is, you know, the solution for the Democrats is to create an even bigger government, that is to say, raise taxes. And the solution by the Republicans is to create a smaller government by cuts, cutting spending. So I think there's very different approaches to what the problem were at hand. But it is clear that unless spending is cut back, this default discussion we're having is just a delay in default if we actually don't default. I don't think anyone thinks we're going to default. But sooner or later, we will default if we continue on this spending pattern. That's no question about it. Well, that's what I wanted to ask you. We're in the middle of this discussion and this debate. And kind of to your point, House Republicans have put forward a plan to at least restrain the growth of spending for a while on the discretionary side. Uh, and there's always and continues to be even now a debate over that statutory increase in the debt or debt limit or without that potentially a default. But your point you just made is somewhat regardless of that, if present trends continue, there could be a moment where this set of fiscal uh, incongruities really overrun our capacity to pay our bills. Is that right? And put yeah, us and into a default scenario. <clears throat> yeah, no, I mean, clearly with the spending growth we've had, that's not sustainable in the future and unless we want to, you know, completely go into a, a public economy in some sense. The, the issue with the, the debt limit debate is not all, it's also that everyone believes there will be no def default in some sense, but even if there's no default, there's damages being done here because the markets have to live with 
small default risks and sometimes large default risks. And that damage is non-trivial, essentially. So if you look at, we haven't experienced default in the US, but we have experienced markets having to deal with default risk. In 2011, when we got downgraded in our debt from the top credit rating down one step, essentially from AAA to AA plus, in that case, you know, the S&P took a hit of about 10 to 16 percent, which is massive amount of wealth that was destroyed from that risk, essentially. Even though we didn't default, there were large costs involved by having the markets face this government risk. And th this, I think, is important because for the last few years, we've seen the government being by far the biggest risk to markets. So the government's, you know, the claim is or aim or objective of government is to stabilize market. And the government has been by far the biggest destabilizer of market, first with imposing price instability, both in real and financial markets through inflation, second with interest rate volatility with the Fed. You know, everyone is worried about how the Fed is going to time its price controls in credit markets, which is in what an interest rate policy is, and how much, when it's going to happen, et cetera. So there's a lot of interest rate volatility. That rate, interest rate volatility led the banks to have trouble because they didn't cope with it well. They maybe should have, but they didn't. <clears throat> so now we have a lot of credit constraints, a lot less lending than we have. And that's kind of the main source where people think this recession is going to have to ultimately come because there's so much constraint in credit markets currently. Tom, when you think about the, the Fed, I mean, do you, do you subscribe to the view that money was too easy for too long and that they created this problem at number one. Number two, if you were in charge of the Fed right now, what would you be doing to stabilize markets and uh, maybe help get us out of this mess? Yeah, so in terms of inflation, which is different from certain market prices, such as energy prices maybe going up because supply is constrained or if prices go up because demand is boosting somewhere, those are different things than what economists think of as inflation, which we think as very broad-based prices and increase uh, price increases throughout the economy. And that ultimately, I believe, cannot be generated by anyone else than the government, essentially, uh, by having money supply go up. So that's kind of a very monetary or Milton Friedman view of the world. But if you look at what happened in 2021, the money supply grew by, you know, 30% or so, north of 30%. Right. Yeah. And then it just came down dramatically in the money supply. So you saw a huge hill if you plot the money supply <clears throat> in terms of money supply growth. And then you saw six or half a year later or a year later, you saw a huge spike in inflation. So, you know, if Milton Freeman was, was alive today, it was, he would basically say, I told you guys, you know. <laughs> so, uh, and, yeah, and, and people he, didn't... he definitely wrote about all that. But... <laughs> But, but Tom, isn't one of our biggest challenges in Washington, one of the challenges I think you've identified repeatedly, this real fascination with the Fed and whether it's money supply or setting interest rates or a target rate means that we've totally lost focus on the balance and the necessity that it's not only monetary policy you need to address, you also need to address fiscal policy as well. They need to work together hand in hand. But since the late 70s, early 80s success in wringing inflation out of the economy, everybody on both sides of the aisle just looked to the Fed over and over and over again for the answer. And that's really short-sighted and incomplete when the tools that are available to be responsible for the economy in the future do involve the fiscal side of the House, too. No, definitely. I mean, fiscal policy is very important, sometimes more important. The sad, I would agree even beyond that and saying it's sad because everything gets focused on bureaucrats driving the economy. We should be talking about which sector deserves capital because it's serving its customers the best, et cetera, and therefore have higher earnings. While we are talking about what is, you know, how will think about when he wakes up in the morning. So I think it's a very misguided focus on a bunch of bureaucrats, what they think. You know, there's all this Fed watching. And if you look at CNBC and Fox Business, et cetera, all the business networks, it's a lot of focus on these bureaucrats, what they're thinking, what they're doing, what they're speaking, what they're speaking for good reasons. They influence markets. 
and they shouldn't be so influential in markets. What should be driving markets is demand and supply, not bureaucrats. And what actually drives the economy, not not eyes on squawk box. But isn't there a third component as well? I mean, if you're going to obsess over bureaucrats, you can obsess over the head of the Federal Reserve. You got to obsess over the head of the OMB, the spending side of the House, the fiscal side of the House. But don't you also, shouldn't we also be obsessing about the leader of regulatory or more importantly, deregulatory efforts, the Office of Information and Regulatory Analytics? Isn't that <clears throat> as, as important in some cases as what we do on the monetary side and fiscal side of the House? No, definitely. It's just harder to quantify. And we actually did Casey Mulligan was kind of the leader within the White House on trying to quantify the value of this deregulation, the dramatic deregulation, which was, you know, more so than Reagan under Trump. And, and but it's very hard and much harder to quantify the value of that, even though it might be much larger, because you're kind of going piece by piece, regulation by regulation. It gets very hard to aggregate across many different sectors, across many different agencies. But it is very, very important. And the compliance cost for industries, particularly for small businesses, is over uh, many times uh, you know, prohibitive compared to big businesses. They can deal with this because they can spread the cost on a much larger customer base of having to deal with government versus a small business can't. They have a smaller customer base. So their costs are going to be raising their prices a lot more. Uh, their regulatory costs are going to be raising their prices a lot more than the big guys. Right. And I mean, it's also an impact on families and individuals, right? You, you start outlawing gasoline engines and, may, and putting new regulations on them. You drive the cost of the cars up. Now there's a family that isn't able to buy a new car uh, or it, it drives up, across, of course, the cost of used cars, which we've seen uh, in the last few years. And they maybe they can't, they don't have enough money to spend on other things. Same thing now. You know, New York is banning gas stoves, so new construction is going to have to find different stoves to put in there. Somebody's going to have to supply those. And during the Obama administration, they changed the EPA regs around wood stoves. And so the wood stoves <clears throat> suddenly increased in price. So it's not just an impact on the businesses and business to business. And you got to remember, there's, to, your, to your central point, which I think is so important, Individuals are really feeling this squeeze of the regulatory onslaught from the Biden administration. No, particularly in energy, right? And I wrote a piece in the National Review where the title of the piece I put was the Biden's war on progressive climate policy. Now, that sounds kind of weird, uh, but it's true, I think, in, the, in an economic sense. So the Biden's approach to climate policy, and that's on not only not only the U.S. administration across the world has been to basically basically engage in <clears throat> what I call costly substitution. Green energy is more costly than brown energy. Otherwise, green energy would just dominate everything. We go there through the markets, essentially, uh, because they would be cleaner and cheaper. But they're more expensive than brown energy, and that's <clears throat> that's a problem. And, and but you're pushing you making people adopt the more expensive energy now the administration will say well we have subsidies it makes the energy cheaper when we have subsidies for green energy that just means that you're paying part of the cost of green energy in taxes to fund those subsidies as opposed to uh, lowering the price there's no free lunch in going from cheaper energy to more expensive green energy and that hits the poor that's why it's regressive. That hits right. the poor a lot more than it does the rich, because the poor consume a larger, much larger fraction of their income on energy, energy than the rich do. <clears throat> so it's a very, very regressive policy compared to innovation, which I think is the best way to solve this problem. And the IRA spends about 78% on this costly substitution, meaning subsidizing people into green energy, as opposed to 1.2% on new innovation, which would lower prices. Once you innovate down green energy prices below brown, you basically have helped the poor more than you have helped the rich because they have a larger burden of energy in their budget, essentially. Right. So, so innovation is progressive and costly substitution is regressive. And much of the regulation, which you, you talked about, Joe, is also regressive because you make the poor adopt green energy, you, you know, make them buy the EVs 
but we don't have any mandates on jets and mansions and yachts right. uh, being green, being green essentially. We just, you know, uh, and this, this is this all I think is very troublesome because <clears throat> per capita pollution is by far higher from the rich part of the population. The rich right. are the ones polluting. The rich are the ones polluting, and basically these policies ask the poor to clean it up. We're going to have to hold it here, but we need you to come back and unpack in much longer detail this conversation, which I think has been incredibly, incredibly informative. It was great. We'll be right back for our next segment. DC EKG with Big Wig Media and our partner, Evergreen.